Thank you, Andy. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see everyone here this morning. We're going to do something we haven't done in a long time. You ready? Everybody stand up. Everybody stand up. All right, and then you, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna go greet one another. Remember, we used to do that. It's been over a year since we've done this, okay? And so hey, keep, uh, if you need to keep your distance, when p- if people come toward you, just go like this, all right? And they'll just smile and give you a virtual hug or whatever, okay? But if you are open to it, just say, come on, come on, baby, okay? All right, so let's just go say hello to one another and greet one another. All right, let's begin finding our way back. So those of you who are watching uh, live stream, uh, we don't want you to feel left out. So if you want to get up off that couch and go over and kiss the TV, you may do so at this, at this time. Yeah. Um, man, that feels good, doesn't it? Just feels good. Um, I, uh, I, I'm so glad to see everyone here today, and then as we go along, there'll be more and more people, and so God has been good to us. So, I, you notice on the front of your bulletin, it says Mission Possible. That's kind of borrowed from Mission Impossible, which is a popular movie series and a TV series, but uh, we are talking about Mission Possible for this month of July. And what makes our mission possible uh, is God. So we thank Him for allowing us the privilege of being a part of His mission. In the 1992 presidential, or I, actually I should say vice presidential debate, uh, some, some of you may remember this. There were not two, but three candidates that year. That was because there was a third-party presidential candidate by the name of Ross Perot. The the debate uh, didn't start well for Admiral Stockdale. He was the running mate for Ross Perot, if you remember that. During his opening remarks, he asked two uh, questions. He asked, number one, who am I and why am I here? This 37-year-old military veteran and one of the highest-ranking officers and highly decorated uh, Navy admiral was made out to be somewhat disengaged and disconnected by both mainline political parties. But those questions are pivotal for all living human beings in discovering their purpose. That is the reason that we exist. You're not here by accident, not by chance or coincidence, but by design. Every single person on the face of this planet is here by design. You, your life, your family, your journey, your experience and your purpose in life is by God's incredible workmanship. Who am I 
and why am I here is the subject of today's message. The Westminster Catechism asks a series of questions. The first and most important question they ask is, what is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Isaiah 43, 7 says, Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. The, the word for glory here means to, it means to honor and to... Uh, we honor Him. We honor His name. We, we honor Him with His will and purpose for our lives. And when you look at the second half of that verse, it says, whom I formed and made. There's two different words there. Form meaning fashioned or as, as a potter would fashion uh, his, uh, the clay into something useful. So he's he formed us, He fashioned us, and also He created, He made, He created us out of nothing. We were nothing until He breathed life into us and He made us. And if God created us and He fashioned us as in a potter's hand, the, the only logical conclusion then we have is that He had a purpose. He did it. For a reason. Now, I don't want you to overlook the beginning of verse 7. It would be very easy to just gloss over it. But it's this phrase, called by my name. Now, what's in a name? Today, names represent your identification. When people want to know what your name is, especially in legal uh, transactions. They want to know your full name, your legal name. You were given a name at birth and you will carry that name into your grave. There may be some derivatives of your name like James might be called Jim or Elizabeth might be called Liz or Beth. But we all have a name. You may have been given your name because it was your parents' wish for you to live up to your name. Names like Christian, Grace, Justin, or Justina. But names in biblical times were more than just identification or wishes. They conveyed their identity. Now that's Different identity is different from identification. Names in biblical times convey their identity, like what they did for a living or where they were from. Jesus of Nazareth, Paul or Saul of Tarsus. So they had names that kind of identified who they were, but where they were from or what they did. But in this passage, Yahweh is not talking about your name or my name. He's talking about His name. God's name. Now, God's name encompasses His whole identity. This omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent God. An all-knowing, an all-present, an all-powerful God, Yahweh. So he is talking about His name. Now, not everyone whom God created is called by His name. Right? You've heard that phrase, we're all God's children. No, we're not. We're all God's creation, but some people have refused 
to surrender to God and, and to uh, accept God as their creator and to live an obedient life for God. They've rejected it, and they're not God's children. They're God's creation. Only those who are in Christ are God's children. Now, if you believe that every human being is God's child, then you have to explain 1 John 3.10. Let's see what that says. By this, it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Or in John 8, 44, Jesus himself said, You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. His children, God's children, are called by his name. What's your name? What's your name? I am Susie of Jehovah. I am Sherry of Yahweh. I am Charles of the one true God. Do you use your adoptive name as your identity? If you have been adopted into the family of God, you have an adopted name. And that name begins with God's name. But you're saying, wait a minute, I thought this sermon was about the Great Commission. Yes, it is. So why are we talking about names? And the answer is because if you're a child of God, you've been adopted into the family of God, and where the family business is the Great Commission. And hence the sermon title, The Family Business. We are called by His name, and we go in His name. So let's take a look at today's passage, Matthew 28, verse 16. Now, I preached on this passage not too long ago, and I was very tempted to just preach the same sermon again. I thought that half of you wouldn't remember it anyway. Right? But the Lord convicted me and said, no, that's the lazy way out. And so this is a brand new sermon. How about that? Let's look at verse 16. Now, the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them and when they saw him, they worshiped, that is, they bowed down. They worshiped him, but some doubted. Now, that just means that they hesitated. Have you noticed how often God speaks to his children on the mountain? What is it about mountains? Mountains are first mentioned during the flood in Genesis chapter 7 when it says, All the mountains were covered. With the water. And then later, when the flood subsided, Mount Ararat is mentioned in chapter 8 where the ark came to rest. Abraham was willing to sacrifice his only son for the Lord on the mountain in Genesis 22. Moses encountered God in the form of a burning bush on the mountain. And later on Mount Sinai, he received the Ten Commandments. He was taken up to Mount Nebo at the end of the 40-year journey in the wilderness where God told him he would not enter the promised land due to his disobedience. Remember that? Now, in the New Testament, you have the famed Mount of Olives, and it's also known as the Mount of Ascension. It's where Jesus ascended into heaven. You have the Mount of Transfiguration. This is where Jesus had two visitors from heaven and was transfigured in his appearance. And then you have the Sermon on the Mount. So what is the significance of mountains? We refer to 
achievements and victories as mountaintop experiences and valleys as the shadow of death or I'm in a valley or I'm having a difficult time. I'm going through a valley. What is it about mountains? Just this week, a few days ago, I went on a bike ride and um, I decided to take this new trail. And so I went up. I've, as I was taking my normal route, I could see uh, in Simi Valley, I could see in the mountains where people were walking up in the mountains. And so I thought, you know, it can't be that hard to go up there, so I'm going to go. And I went up, and I got to this, this plateau, and it was, it was amazing. You just, you just want to stay up there. You just, you just want to sit and, and view. And just, I mean, it's as far as you could see. It's a beautiful day. And then I, I started to go back down, and I saw this Y, and I thought, you know, I'm going to get like a run and start because I'm going down the hill, and I can make halfway up that hill, and I'd be, I'd be okay. Well, what I didn't realize was how steep that, that second hill was. And I got about two-thirds of the way, and I put in the lowest gear, and I'm not going to lie, I, I have an e-bike, and so it should have helped me. And, but I got to where I could not pedal anymore. And so I had this thought, it's like, you know, if you just stop and turn around and go back, it would be so much easier. But then there's just something else in me that said, you know what, if I don't make it to the top, I, I, I'm, I'm going to be a loser. I'm going to be a quitter. And I don't want to be a quitter. And so I got off and I pushed that thing and it felt like it weighed like 400 pounds. I just, and I pushed and I, my foot was slipping, and it was gravel, and, but I finally got to the top, and, and I was rewarded with this wonderful view overlooking Simi Valley, and it's beautiful. What is it about mountaintops? Well, I think partly is that you have a different perspective when you're on a mountain. There are places here in the valley that you can go to. You can go up on these hills, not necessarily mountains, but you can go up high enough where you can see the whole valley, and it changes your perspective. You're in your backyard, and it's fenced and whatever, and uh, you, you think, man, this world is small. And you might feel alone, but then you go up on the mountaintop, and you see this whole valley, and you, and you, and you see, wow, there's a lot of people here. You know, there's a place right up here. It's called the Odyssey. Have you ever been there? It's called the Odyssey. You know why they call it the Odyssey? Because the view. You ought to see it. <laughs> it's, it's a wonderful view up there. But I think it's because it changes your perspective. Not only that, it gets you away from the noise of every day now they didn't have cell phones and television and cable and wi-fi and all that back then but still i think that that in the city in the town there was there was always noise there was there were always distractions so jesus takes them up on the mountain God takes His people up on the mountain. No different here. He tells them, meet me on the mountaintop. It's just a matter of perspective. He wanted them to have a quiet place where they can contemplate what He was about to tell them. Verse 18, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Me. The word authority there means the power to act. The power, this power of authority has been activated where? In heaven and on earth. Jesus' authority echoes in heaven and on earth. Now he's made this claim before of this authority 
Before the resurrection, he made, these, he made this same claim, but now his resurrection proves that he is the Messiah. He conquered death. They watched him die. And yet he was just as alive as ever, and he was talking to them, and he told them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I don't know about you, but I would be very interested in knowing what he was going to say next. Wouldn't you? Verse 19. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. There's much debate, scholarly debate, uh, about this word go. Some say that it means as you are going. The word go, now I'm, uh, I'm not trying to impress you here, I just, I just copied it, I cut and pasted this from one of the commentaries. Okay, so it, it is a heiress, passive, participle, nominative, masculine, plural verb. There. Wow, no, I won't. <laughs> so the best English cha- uh, translation would be having gone. What that means is it, it, it's not an option. They're not saying, he's not saying, please go. It's not that kind of imperative. What he's saying is he's just assuming already that as a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're already going. You're already on your way. So when he says go, therefore, having gone, therefore. Make disciples. Make disciples. It implies that you're already on your way. Then he says, make disciples of all nations. Now, this this is an amazing thing. Nations is the, is the, the Greek word ethnos. It's where we get the word ethnicity. Okay? Now, in, the, in a Jewish term, speaking to a bunch of Jews... What it meant was to the outside world, people who were not Jewish. Now we find comfort in people like us, right? People that look like us, people that talk like us, people that think the way we do, people that have the same political ideology as we do, people that vote the way that we do, people that shop at the places we shop at, or maybe live in the same neighborhood or like the same style of house or, you know, just on and on and on and on. We, we love hanging around people that are like us. There's just a comfort level with that. Right? I like my NASCAR buddies. You know, I, I mean, I don't know how many NASCAR fans are, are, are in L.A., but uh, it, when I find one and I meet one, I'm, I'm all over it. I'm like, hey, what's happening? You know, it's, it's, just, it's just you feel this comfort level. But here, Jesus is saying, go and make disciples. Now, he's talking to a bunch of Jews. And when he said, make disciples of all nations, they got it. They got that what it meant was those people that persecute them. Those people that are not like them. Those people that occupy their land. Go and make disciples of all nations. So that begs the question, do you, do I, do we reach out to people who are not like us? We come up with all kinds of excuses. There's, there's a language barrier or you know, they, 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 they wouldn't want to talk to us. We're not like them. 
We come up with all kinds of excuses. But when you look here, you see that Jesus is challenging us to go outside of our comfort zone. That's why he had to take him up on the mountaintop to give them a perspective to see. No doubt from where they were standing, they could probably see off in the distance villages and, and gatherings of people groups who are not like them. And he says, go and make disciples of all nations. There's three sub-imperatives, I call, right here in this passage. The first is to disciple, to go and make disciples. Number two is baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then number three is teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. So there's three things. Discipling, baptizing, and teaching. Discipling means uh, learning. The emphasis is not on the decision, but the lifestyle of learning. You know, Baptists, if we've, we've been guilty of this. It's, it's, we, just, we just tell people, hey, pray this sinner's prayer. And, and, and you'll be saved. And they pray that sinner's prayer, and you go, okay, my work is done. They're saved. But there's nowhere in the Bible that tells us that that's what we're supposed to do. It's not just the decision that's important. It's the lifestyle that's important. We're supposed to be making disciples. We're supposed to be discipling people. And then baptizing. Well, you know, baptism is not necessary for salvation. We know that. You know, baptism doesn't save us. There's, there's no magic in that water. There's no, nothing in that water that saves a person. Baptism is not necessary for salvation, but it's absolutely necessary for obedience. And obedience is the first sign of salvation. Think about that. If you refuse to be baptized, can you really say that you're saved? Because first thing you want to do when you're truly saved, the first thing you want to do is say, Lord, I surrender everything to you. What, what do you want me to do? And it's very clear in Scripture, he says, be baptized. If you are disobedient to God's commands, how can you claim to have surrendered to his lordship? And then teaching. What are we to teach? I mean, it's, I think sometimes we're really good about teaching about the facts of Jesus, the facts of God. But here, it, it says very clear, teach them to observe. It's not just to take this Bible and look at it and say, oh, that's interesting. That's not observing. Observing means being obedient to his word. Teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. So there it is. There, there's the obedience. It's something to teach facts about Jesus, but we're supposed to teach obedience. Then he says in the last part of verse 20, And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Here we have the promise of the one who has all the power and all the authority, and he says that he will be with us to the end of the age. The, the phrase end of the age refers to the second coming of Christ. It, isn't it? it, just, it's, it it's kind of, I mean, not funny, but it's interesting. Think about what he's saying. The, the one, he's, he's omnipresent. He's here now, he's in the future. He's here with us now, and yet he is with the Father. Right? He's here, and he'll never leave us, he'll never forget, forsake us, and yet he's coming back for us. 
The omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent God says, I am with you until I come back to you. So what are these passages, what is this passage saying to us? Those of us who are in Christ are saved to bring glory to God. This is why we exist. We were made to bring glory to God and enjoy Him. By virtue of our adoption into God's family, we are participants of the family business. You remember in Luke, when Jesus was 12 years old, they took Him to the temple? And then, you know, and then they started their way back home, and then they realized, oh, where is Jesus? You know, they, 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 uh, Mary thought that, that he was with Joseph. Joseph thought that he was with Mary. And, you know, give them a break because they didn't travel as families. They traveled, like the, the, the women traveled together and the men traveled together. And the kids kind of went back and forth. And so, you know, you can understand why they were missing them for, for a whole day. So they go back, they go all the way back to the, to the temple, uh, to Jerusalem. They go in the temple and they find him here. What did he say? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? The King James translation. Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? In the kingdom of God, in God's family, the family business is disciple making. It's not tent making. It's not water purifying. It's not home building. It's discipling. Are you in the family business? Are you partakers of the family business? Every believer ought to be participant in the family business, which is discipling. No matter where you are in life, if you're just beginning as a Christian, you ought to be in, in the family business of being discipled. And you ought to be, be in the process of being discipled for the purpose of one day being a discipler. Discipleship is not a, a course that you take and, uh, and, and, and receive a merit and get a degree and, and then hang that on your wall. And it's not a, it's not a time and period in history of your life. Discipleship is a way of life. It's a lifestyle. It's from the beginning of your spiritual life until the day you die. You and I are supposed to be a part of discipleship. Either being discipled or discipling somebody. That is our family business. So here's what I want to do this morning in the time that we have left. I'm going to ask you to make a commitment. I'm going to ask you, if you are a believer, now if you're not a believer, please, please don't feel any obligation to join the family business. But we do invite you to join the family. But if you are part of the family of God, if you, if you are unequivocally and, and you are sure and you, you proclaim that you are a Christian, that you are a follower of Jesus Christ, in a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand and, and we're going to have a, a, a prayer over you. Consider it like a commissioning service, if you will. But I would like for those of you who are either in participation with discipleship and, and I'm not talking about someone who's gone through the course and has come to a conclusion, and now you're, you're back to doing what you're doing. But what I'm talking about is someone who is committed to a lifestyle of discipleship. Because we have decided at this church that 
our mission, and the reason God has us on this planet, and the reason this church exists, is to go and make disciples. And if you want to be or are a part of that mission. I want to ask you to stand right now. Wherever you are, just stand right now. You might, you might be at the beginning part of it. You may not even be a part of discipleship yet, but you want to be. Just, I want to just ask you to stand. That's awesome. If you're at home and you're watching by live stream, stand up in your living room, wherever you are. Stand up. Dads, stand up. Let your kids see you standing, making commitment. I don't care how young you are or how old you are. Discipleship should be our lifestyle. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this commission, this, this great commission we call, where you tell us to go and make disciples of all nations, to go out of our way, to go to people, uh, people groups that we are not familiar with or not comfortable with, but you tell us that wherever we go to make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe all that you've commanded them. And thank you, Lord, for that promise that you never leave us, you never forsake us. God, I pray for those who are standing right here and those who are standing in their living rooms and in their homes. God, that you would solidify and then burn it into their hearts, Lord, that, that they must be about the business of discipleship. These close-knit, tight groups where you can be vulnerable and open and grow together and admonish one another and build one another, encourage one another, cry with one another and celebrate victories with one another. Lord, we know that that's how you design this human nature even, that, we, that that's what we crave. And that there's a, there's a lost world within our community, within this valley, within our neighborhoods. There, there are people who are lost and, and, and who will spend eternity in hell without knowing you and we, without, without being discipled. So Lord, I pray that you will charge the hearts of those who are standing. You will embolden them. And that they will commit to a lifestyle, a lifelong commitment of discipleship and whatever process. Lord, we know that there are some who are standing who have never been discipled. I pray, Lord, that you will, you will put them in, a, in the right group to be discipled. There are men standing here, dads who are standing, Lord. I pray that they will be effective disciple makers in their home and that they will disciple uh, those who, the, who they know, who they come in contact with. God, we know that there are people in here, they've been, they've been disciples for a long time, and they've been discipling people for a long time. Lord, thank you for those who have gone before us, who give us an example of true discipleship. Lord, continue to use those men and women as disciplers. And Lord, remind us also, Lord, that, that we, we never arrive, that we are, we're all, always in need of being discipled by you and by others, that we're all in need of being sharpened and directed and encouraged. Lord, I pray for these who are standing. That this as their commissioning service. That from this day forward, that they would be about a lifestyle of discipleship. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, let me ask.